good evening everyone and uh, i know we all are busy and we took our, our times to come and to be part of this uh, wonderful initiative by dr go uh, and i feel also very happy that uh, this is something that i am trying to give back to the society in a way um, briefly about myself i am um, uh, manoj kumar panigrahi uh, i am currently an assistant professor at jindal school of international affairs op jindal global university which is at sonipat very close to delhi and um, i did my uh, college that's the undergrad is in uh, where i am from uh, from my home state odisha uh, then my masters was from jindal itself and um, i did my phd from taiwan so i came back to taiwan uh, so i came back to india sometime in february and uh, what i am going to do right now is i'll be quickly Uh, take you through of between india and taiwan relations and at max probably about 20 30 minutes and then we'll be followed by a q and a session and i hope you all ask me questions because or else uh, this so much effort that was put up by dr gore will uh, not be i think uh, coming back to this so we do know on october 20 if you say october 20 um, in uh, october 20 one of the indian politician came out with this uh, posters of taiwan um, putting up on the screen on the in front of the chinese taiwan chinese embassy and it caused a lot of worry and it caused a lot of anger among the chinese people about this but coming to the background of the between india and taiwan relations so india follows one china policy and due to which india don't have any sort of relations with taiwan and because of no diplomatic relations we don't have our embassies there but in 1995 both sides india and taiwan agreed to have um, a representative office on each other so they don't call it as an embassy or high commission they call it as a representative office so the indian representative office in taipei is known as india taipei association okay and the person who is in charge of that is known as director general okay and the one who is in taipei sorry the one who is from taiwan in new delhi is uh, is also known as the uh, representative of taiwan okay it's not an ambassador of taiwan they don't have diplomatic cards they don't have any diplomatic privileges that other diplomats can get but the taiwan embassy in india is known as taipei economic and cultural center in india tecc and tcc is in two places one is in new delhi and the other is in chennai so coming back to this uh, the story of taiwan why taiwan why it is being done right so taiwan was actually was at first if i go briefly into the history it was always been an independent i'm not saying for taiwan or against china i'm just saying the facts and this is what happened in the history is that in 1911 and when the republic of china led by sun yat sen uh, the leader he uh, tried to fight against the monarchy in taiwan in china the qing dynasty so he defeated them and he established republic of china in main china on main china roc under the party party was kuomintang kmd in brief it is called as blue party or kmd party right so it started from there and that followed by the civil war that happened in early 1930s in Th- in china between the communist mao led communist mao zedong led communist forces and nationalist forces the kmt forces of sun yat sen over the years then the world war 2 started they started to cooperate among each other but after the surrender of japan in 1945 they started to fight again and once the fight intensified the nationalists lost most of the forces and their area under the control and they moved to taiwan under sun yat sen uh, under chiang kai shek in 1948 49 and this is where most of the chinese characteristics came into taiwan and kmt started to rule over taiwan even though the K- roc had never controlled um taiwan or before roc also not many uh, not enough uh, the chinese dynasties qing ming Uh, dynasties never wanted to have taiwan because it was considered as something as a savage land in the old past and it was basically a place for most of the where the pirates used to come and take a bases over here okay 
and KMT after it came uh, to Taiwan in 1948, and they started to rule over island very ironclad. There was a martial law that began in 28 February 1948 uh, because of one incident that is called 228 incident. You may go, uh, Google or we can have a discussion about it, 228 incident later on. So the martial law stayed in Taiwan until late 1980s, early 1991. And that followed by a democracy. Uh, in Taiwan. So Taiwan is a very new democracy in the region, in the Eastern Asia region or the entire, pardon me, in, in entire Asia. Okay. And how does it relate with India's lookist and activist policy? As you may know, might have known by now that India's lookist started in 1991. And at that time, Taiwan was not a part of the bigger picture of India's uh, look his policy and later on when the current prime minister prime minister modi he came up he started doing this activist asia policy where to try to establish more focus more actionable uh, relationships towards east asia and southeast asia so if this is if this the activist policy is an opportunity to recast and revitalize ties with east asia then this recasting must cover taiwan i would say at pre at present terms before yes Whatever happened, happened. We didn't. But as of now, we should focus on Taiwan. Why? So the question comes up here. Where is Taiwan in, in the radar of Indian foreign policy? Okay, And where does Taiwan fit into the strategic goals of India? Moving back to here, where we sp spoke about active policy. We have something similar that came out from Taiwan towards its western coast or the western side. So if you look at Taiwan in the geography, the west one of the West country, the biggest and one of the biggest country comes is India. So Taiwan started since late 1980s. Taiwan started to uh, have this policy called Go South policy. Then it followed by Southbound policy. Then at present in 2016, it started by uh, the current president of Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, uh, the new Southbound policy. So what does this new Southbound policy talks about? New Southbound policy talks about yes, we don't have diplomatic relations but we can cooperate on other factors such as education, economy, tourism, agriculture, and uh, one more thing that is keeping my mind as of now. And it is considered as a signature policy of Taiwan because if it's overly dependent, so they try to diversify their, uh, uh, their portfolios basically in economies and tourism sectors. So they started in 2016 and it's Southbound policy, NSP. And again, there's a lot to talk about NSP, but I'll be limiting myself to this right now. So when we talk about prospective uh, traditional security, when the traditional security where we have government to government, minister to minister level talks, we are unable to do so. The Taiwanese side are unable to contact Indians and Indians are unable to do so with the Taiwan. The reason, we don't have diplomatic relations between them. So the mostly the focus comes up with track 1.5 and track two or track three diplomacy where think tanks, intellectuals, students like we all, we visit Taiwan or they visit us and then the interaction happens, okay? And in the past, uh, in 2016, actually in very recent, I would say 2016 and in 2020, 2020 was in online mode where the government of India sent some ministries and party delegates to Taiwan, to Taiwan president swearing in ceremony. This showed some kind of change into India's one China policy where India said that there's only one China that is PRC, okay? There has been a call to elevate such to cabinet level talks, but it is unable to do so because as per the, as I'm sure you all have learned over the lectures and you know, through your studies, that PRC has a claim over Southern Tibet that it's called to Arunachal Pradesh, right? So PRC is just taking over the demands that ROC is doing, Republic of China, that is Taiwan. They're brilliant. Taiwan also have the constitution of Taiwan, the old times of constitution. It has claims of over Arunachal Pradesh. And in 1987, Taiwan came out with this, um, when India changed the name of Arunachal Pradesh from NEFA, Northeast Frontier Agency, it changed NEFA to Arunachal Pradesh. Taiwan formally um, had a diplomatic uh, protest against this. Although it was not a diplomatic protest because we didn't have relationship with them, 
but it is more like a diplomatic statement that came out opposing India's move. So one of the, as sovereignty is key to any particular nation, whether it's an authoritarian or whether it's a democratic country, that brings a biggest challenge for Indian side to elevate the such ties to Earth style. So that was the traditional security. Now we move to the non-traditional security, right? When we say limit, there are limited political conditions, okay, and there are limited connections as well. Need to we need to look at India-Taiwan relations from a new perspective, something beyond the factor of of a third party. So whenever we talk about India-Taiwan, India-Taiwan, always China comes up or some USA comes up. So instead of looking into a, in a triangular relationship or in a uh, tripartite relationship, we should look this into as uh, something as a bilateral relationship, where diplomatic or not. And focus should be in the areas where there are not so much of diplomatic relations are required, such as health, economy, and education. And um, you will be surprised to know every year, Taiwan gives scholarship to about 2,073 students almost. The government scholarships are three different types, but overall, most of the students who, who are ba basically belong to uh, social uh, science platforms, uh, let's say engineering or those ways, they get funding from the professor there. They get these fundings, but they also face their own challenges that we can talk about it. But there is huge number of students find Taiwan as an attractive destination for the further studies. Coming to economics, 1995 to 2000, the trade turnover has grown between Taiwan and India by five, more than five times from 1995 to 2000. From earlier, it was 934 million by 1995, but by when it 2000, in the year 2000, the, the trade was about $5 billion. But since uh, 2018, the trade has gone down by 17% year on year. One of the reasons that has been blamed here because of the COVID-19. But my question is, if COVID-19 is to be blamed, the trade should decline from 2020, not from 2018. Why is it so? Right? And despite the fact that the economic interest of the two nations dovetail nicely, both ones high economic growth, the economic exchange is still relatively small. In 2020, the share of Taiwan's trade with India is only nine point sorry it's only 0.76% of its global trade so Taiwan's export towards India is only 0.76% as compared to with China it is 24.3% and i did get some data that written over here uh, just a minute ah uh, yes here it is so with China the trade data is 24.3% with US 16.1, ASEAN countries 17.3, Japan 6.8, Hong Kong 12.8, and to Korea it was 4.6. So you see this about 25% of the Taiwan Strait is concentrated towards China. That involves a lot of complexity between the cross-state relations when we talk about China and Taiwan, right? So next, since 1980s, uh, we, they had this, as I mentioned before, the new southbound policy. Taiwan tried to focus on Southeast Asia to find an alternate to China. As the famous saying goes, do not put all your eggs in one basket. That's what the Taiwan is tried. But again, like any other democracy, they also face the same challenge that whenever there's a new president comes up from a new party, the policy gets tweaked or some change or there is not enough funding or concentration. So such um, efforts goes into vain. And it goes back to square one. Currently, uh, the next election will be happening in 2024. So maybe if there is a new uh, if the opposition party, the KMT, comes over to the power, maybe the new Salvan policy will also decline. So just time to say what will be done and all. India-Taiwan economic relations, again, is a very optimistic area I think can be walked on with where both nations should focus on trade. And... Uh, what India can offer to Taiwan? What India can offer to Taiwan? It can offer large market. It has almost a huge market. 1.3 billion people live here. So it provides a huge market to Taiwanese companies. Low-cost skilled workers. Robust service sector. 
an alternative to China and global supply chain reconfigurations. After the, especially after the US-China conflict, the trade war, conflict means the trade war that I want to say, and also the uh, post COVID-19, there is a less trust among the Chinese, uh, among the China. So most of these uh, countries who have manufacturing bases in China are looking for alternates and India should and should take this as an advantage and should uh, be show itself to the world that we are alternative to the to China and it will help in its atmanirbhar or make in India policies that we are, the current government of India is talking about. Coming to the FDI, uh, again, Taiwan's investment into India. As of now, until uh, the data, the last available data, until September 2019, uh, FDI from Taiwan to India is only $329 million. And there are about 140 Taiwanese companies operating in, in India. Significantly lower as compared to Southeast Asian countries where Taiwanese companies are there or Chinese companies. In China, there are more than 1 lakh Taiwanese companies operating. And in Southeast Asia, there are more than 25,000. Okay. Okay. So that comes to the education. Now we move, uh, sorry, that comes to the economy. Now we move into education. Okay. In 2010, uh, if you study abroad, you will be coming up uh, across that you have to authenticate your certificates for a foreign country whenever you go. So in 2010, India and Taiwan kind of signed this agreement that we have to we agree mutual degree recognition that a degree owned by a particular individual in India or in Taiwan will be reciprocated on either of those two countries. And Taiwan has around 160 accredited universities around the island and it welcomed thousands. And I was a part of that student body in Taiwan. And I know I met, I met so many friends around the world from different parts of the world and different continents. So it was very amazing experience for me as well. And so do those who are there. An increasing number of Indian students in Taiwan. As I mentioned before, there are 2,783 students as of now I'm talking. There are 2,783 students in Taiwan on various capacity. Some went for language training, some went for, um, let's say, master's, undergrad, PhDs, postdoc. So there are people there a lot, especially in science and IT. And coming to political, that is my the last aspect of the last variable. Coming to political concerns and insufficient mechanism is the one of the biggest thing that hinders is the India's one China policy, uh, where we don't have this minister or state level talks with them. So we always have to go into track 1.5 or track 2 type of talks. Okay. So what can be done? There has been a growing talk about having a more comprehensive dialogue uh, because COVID-19 has happened and that influenced as, as yesterday. If you follow the Indian Foreign Ministry spokesperson, Arindam Bhakti, he came up with a statement that Taiwan state, pardon me, Taiwan state should not be militarized. And this is the first statement ever done by MEA of India or over Taiwan Strait. So there is a change of perceptions. There is a change of growing voice in MEA saying that we have to grow closer to, uh, not grow closer, but it is a message to China that whenever we want, we can play the Taiwan card. Challenges uh, to both this, for this uh, bilateral relationship between India and Taiwan is the activist policy and New South Wales policy of both the countries lack clear objectives what both nations want from each other. There is a bigger picture, but there's no such focused approach to it. So there is no clear vision. Tangible outcome should be the motive. And Republic of China, as I said, is still claims Arunachal Pradesh in its constitution. And what India faces, what uh, challenges that comes from India towards Taiwanese companies. One is the poor infrastructure that we have, that we need to agree. The quality of hardware, especially the supply chain, the difficulty in management of human resource, restriction by central and local governments. Whenever a company comes from a foreign company, they face one central government laws and then the state level laws. So it gets very confusing. Let's say if I'm the investor, I want to invest $500 million. I want to have 10 set of policies wherever I go and finish it, invest and earn profit for myself. But here, when companies come, they do face a lot of these challenges. 
where they have to go run around different offices, the rate difference. Inconvenient transportation, corruption, culture and language gap to the Taiwanese side. As this speak traditional Chinese and in India, we have multiple different languages, even though it's English is there now, but even though we speak multiple different languages, they face difficulty in, on this part. So what can be done? So what can be done is probably to have a trade talks with Taiwan to reduce the tariffs so that the more export and import can happen. Promote one-stop investment related queries where a foreign company can come and just go and okay, this is the place where I have to go and clear all my doubts. Finding a set developed niche products for Indian market. So Indian consumers are mostly uh, very price sensitive. Every, we all want discounts. We all want the best quality at the best discount rates, right? Like we have Amazon sales, uh, Flipkart sales, Freedom sales. So we all do shopping at a discount rate. So this is where we're going to look at. And the next is the language training where Taiwan can help in India a lot uh, of learning Chinese. So what Taiwan has, has done is they have Taiwan education centers across universities and Jindal happens to be the first Taiwan education center which had the language center from Taiwan in 2011 itself. And as of now, there are about 24 language training centers about from Taiwan in different universities around. I'm sure some of your universities might have. If not, maybe in your future studies, you may come across. So these are some things that uh, I will be stopping here where that can be done, that's the challenges and such. And I apologize to Go Mr. Gore and also to the participants uh, that I faced some technical difficulties and uh, there was a power cut from my side as well. Thank you and I look forward for your Q&As. Thank you, Dr. Manoj. Uh, sometimes there are problems which are beyond our control, <laughs> but don't worry, we will uh, edit everything and uh, put it in a uh, fine manner. Uh, now I think uh, uh, I should open the uh, house for question answer session. And now I will ask the participants to first introduce themselves and then put the question in a simple manner, clear manner, so it is understood by the guest. And uh, uh, don't uh, delay your questions. Whosoever wants to ask questions, please. Be quick. Yes, come on. And I have a small request. If you are asking me a question, please switch on your camera so that I would love to see you, how you look. Uh, yeah. So that's a very small request from me. Uh, so yes, looking forward. Feel free to ask me questions. Come on. Sir, I do have a question. May I introduce myself? Yes, please, please. Sir, I'm Riya Sharma and I'm currently pursuing my master's in political science from my very home hometown in Bikaner, Rajasthan. So, sir, my question is, recently in an article, uh, Mr. Shan Saran, he made a point that Chinese military capabilities have grown to an extent where American victory in defense of Taiwan isn't guaranteed. So, sir, given Chinese extensive investment in building its navy, is there a possibility of China overcoming US in case a war breaks up? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question, uh, Maria. Uh, well, see, uh, China being a sovereign state by itself, nobody can stop itself to, uh, by, to do whatever they want to do. Like nobody can do what policies we are making and New Delhi. We do whatever we do in our own book borders, right? Coming to uh, that numerical superiority, yes, China already have the numerical superiority over the US Navy in the region, but as of now, the technical superiority, the amount of experience that the US Navy have, I would doubt that Chinese can do. And a lot of things also comes into the propaganda that comes up saying uh, um, that uh, China will annihilate. Uh, you might come across such words, annihilate or make U.S. Navy disappear from the region as such. But it's not that easy uh, in real terms. And uh, because politics and war cannot be run over emotions, whether you like it or not, 
you cannot win wars based on hashtags based on how much good video quality editing you have right but again uh, this are some of the one thing that chinese has been doing very good one that's what i think i spoke today in the morning as well in the class that is the disinformation warfare so you do look into some of the uh, for example after right after doklam incident uh, some of the think tanks in india some newspapers they gave space to the chinese ambassador to speak out which is kind of uh, i would say uh, speaks a lot about how much influence they have in our media right so but we never did our indian foreign minister or did indian prime minister or did india's ambassador to china got a similar platform in china like we gave to them did we no we didn't get it we didn't give them so in the similar terms if thai china do want to attack taiwan it's up to them but taiwan is will different us as per law it is as per the agreement they will defend they'll try to defend but again policies changes we never know what's going to happen but uh, in the coming 5 years i don't think this is happening so in 6th year i can't say but i can look into only for the first 5 years from now uh, future is nothing in our hands yes thank you so uh, there's one more question so actually yes. the question came up because uh, this narrative of uh, the build up of chinese uh, naval ships came from the us diplomats itself uh, and not from the chinese uh, yes. so my another question was that so uh, there was i read in an article that in india can use china's occupation with uh, taiwan or the south china sea or the east china sea uh, dispute as an opportunity to strengthen its capabilities in its border areas so sir my my question is do you really think that india can use the taiwan issue uh, with respect to in with, to coax china in the border dispute given the fact that uh, despite uh, recognizing the one china policy we haven't made an official mention of it in the past 10 years or so yes so uh, as i just for your statement that the us uh, navy personnel they have been saying this that china is growing 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 chinese navy since 2008 it's nothing new okay so since 2008 it has been going on you if you look into uh, obama's indo pacific strategy the pivot that came out india is being one of the pivot for uh, the us asia pacific strategy so it it is there it is there we cannot stop chinese what they are doing what we can do is we need we can only be ready for what they are going to do later on okay coming to your question about whether india can use taiwan card has certainly in the last two st statements at, after a very long time it did uh, put up uh, the statements coming about saying avoiding militarization just just as i said uh, earlier about taiwan but i don't think big countries big countries with economy they themselves have not done um recognize taiwan or they don't use taiwan card as of now so so i don't think india can use specifically military based on military politically yes they can but militarily and not not so much not so much because for taiwan they need naval forces at first or the air forces but with the indian it is the land borders the land army that is mostly focused uh, so that's where i see the difference between india and taiwan Yes. Next question. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, if I may ask, I hope I am audible and visible. Yes. Uh, sir, I am Gaurav. I am currently pursuing political science honors from Kirodi Mal College, University of Delhi. And my question to you is that since two thousand and fourteen, we have seen India moving towards a culturally diplomatic uh, policy, and it is also like uh, they are also adamant the ministry of external affairs to implement that act east act east policy so sir what is the basic uh, what is the basic thing that india is going to earn from its bilateral uh, relations with taiwan because if we uh, look at the uh, past statistics we can see that the economic exchange between india and taiwan is almost insignificant 
it is yes, less yes. than one percent of the global trade that India does. At the same time, the uh, Taiwanese direct investment in India is very less than the investment which is doing in other Southeast Asian countries like Cambodia and uh, Thailand and other these countries. So, how can India benefit from that relationship, or is there any benefit of it establishing relations with uh, Taiwan? Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you uh, for this question. Well, see um, what we can gain from Taiwan. So again, uh, I talked about what is the problem, but uh, thanks for bringing this out. What we can gain from Taiwan is, I will pull us serve back to the history that the growth of the Chinese economy, the Western, the coastal part of China, the thing that happened because of the Taiwanese investments. Okay. And this is where they are trying to diversify. And this is where India has to get. Uh, especially the cheap semiconductors. How many of you bought new cell phones and laptops recently? Or if you have ordered a car, a smart car or an automatic car, um, you must have been, it must have been delayed to you by a couple of months or a couple of weeks or days. Why this is happening? This is happening to the and that technology is the future of the world as of now. Okay. Everyone uses cell phone, everyone uses laptop. And this is where Taiwan is significant to India. And this is where the recently Vedanta, he came out with an agreement with one of the Taiwanese company, chip making company to have a joint partnership. And all. so uh, as of now, uh, we are talking about 12 nanometer thickness, 12 nanometer thickness of chips that are going to uh, have been produced to be in India. It will take time in, in India to produce because it needs production of chips needs a huge quantity of water, a huge quantity of water where, so wherever they supply, set up the plants, they need to be, that plant needs to be easily accessible to the ports, easily accessible to uh, other means of transport, need to have a proper and good electricity supply, right? So they're scouting for places around, um, if I'm not wrong, they kind of decided somewhere in Maharashtra, uh, but again, we need to leverage this that the Taiwanese have, that is the semiconductor industry. And more than that, they also do have um, other technologies such as space and things where we I see more and more collaboration can happen between the two sides. So just forgetting in uh, China for one second. So you have to focus on Taiwan. Yeah. Thank you. Next question. Good evening, sir. I'm Shorbani and I'm a postgraduate student in political science and so thank you for enlightening us on Indian Taiwan relations. So my question is with regard to the semiconductor and the ship industry like you mentioned. Uh, there were talks going on around various debate shows that because China is suddenly uh, attacking Taiwan and the chip and chip, the people who manufacture chip and the FDI which Taiwan gets might get directed to India. So, sir, uh, what, if, is there any such possibility that if the semi chip con, uh, conductor industry that is based in Taiwan gets <coughs> Taiwan gets shifted to India, relations will be dramatically <coughs> affected, or would it be that the relations would be better? So, uh, thank you, Sorbani, for your question. So, am I just uh, correct me? Am I? Uh, are you talking about India Taiwan relations being getting better or India China? Uh, India Taiwan, sir. Because uh, uh, according to rumor, yeah. that many of the uh, investment that Taiwan gets for the semiconductor the chip you mentioned because of China attacking yes, Taiwan, yes. India but, might get those investment. Okay. See, um, again, um, I just mentioned to Gaurav's uh, answer as well while I'm speaking. We are talking about twelve nan thickness of chips from Taiwan to uh, exports where they kind of but the niche technology that Taiwan is right now is Taiwan is producing two nanometer thickness okay that's the niche technology India needs right now so why iPhone is so expensive right because it's chips of are very small space so that the other things can be added into those iPhones right or lap lap of Apple companies things. So most of them are produced by the Taiwanese companies. So that's the niche technology that we need. Um, whether India can be a uh, alternate to China, 
as of now i don't think so because of multiple reasons first is we do lack the cultural understanding of both the sides i remember when i first went to taiwan and i was telling to my friends uh, i'll share an article with uh, dr go later you may uh, dr go i request you to please share it with uh -huh. others as well about what is the um, uh, what is the suffering of uh, what is the what is the how people think of taiwan in india so when i say taiwan people, most of the time people think it is taliban okay so we and or in about india when i say i am from india then people think oh isn't your country poor right so, so there is this kind of understanding is there as now just because it is uh, semiconductors i don't think uh, there will be a greater interaction but it may be greater interaction between the business communities but not to the government to government level still yes next question I, I, yes next question yes i'm from assam and i did my uh, post grad from delhi university's history department in modern history so uh, i just had a question like a uh, news just caught my eye like india is silent in regard to the chinese uh, china who uh, performed the military drill in a few couple of days back so uh, if india is also uh, trying to develop its economic or education drills with taiwan better so like uh, is india like being silent in it is also like uh, you can say it's better way or in a negative way um the uh, your voice was cutting off uh, i'm even if you type it down for me thank you and yes uh, i may take the next question uh, so till dikshita types of uh, question uh, if anybody else want to ask yes next question come on sir uh, i have another question uh so, so this is gorav gorav please yes sir so my question is that uh, what do you think so is he there yeah you go on go on okay uh, so so my question is that what do you think is are the inherent interest self interest of us in reigniting the Tali, uh, taiwan issue Dr. Maroosh, can you hear him? I can. Can you? Hello, Dr. Maroosh, can you hear him? Hello. Please unmute yourself and ask. Uh, yes. So my question was that what is what are the self interest of US in reigniting this Taiwan issue all of a sudden? Self interest of US. Of US. Okay. See, um, this is something uh, that I would say it's not on US. It's also about the. House of Represent. I'm not uh, an expert on US, so I may not be able to answer you properly. Uh, I'm sorry because I don't study that much about US. But as as of now, uh, if I would say um, the US is that uh, is the challenges that they say they they want to show to Chinese side that we can go wherever we want to go, and nobody can challenges whether it's China or Russia. We don't care. that's the like it still wants to show that we are the leaders right and uh, 
that's they want and it's the house of representative speaker nancy pelosi was visited and before even nancy pelosi visit in 1997 there was um, this person uh, newt gingrich he was also visiting taiwan in 1997 and it was right after the missile crisis that happened in 1995 96 um, in taiwan between taiwan and china so nancy pelosi is, is not the one but it's kind of a symbolic gesture showing that yes we we are the powerful nation you cannot stop us we will go wherever you want us we want to go yeah i think that's one way i would like to see that Yes, next question. Uh, Dr. Varu, there is a question in the chat box. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, Dikshita, does India maintaining silence of the five military drill against can be just as the ones are trying to develop its relationship and also maintaining silence? See, um, Dikshita, your question uh, about maintaining silence when it comes to uh, China, uh, sorry, the Taiwan, China's military drill against Taiwan. I think uh, this statement it could have been true had you if this question if had we had this session two days back or three days back, but yesterday only the Indian Foreign Spokesperson, the Ministry of External Ministry Spokesperson, spokes, spokesperson Dr. Uh, uh, Bakchi, he kind of said that we should not we, uh, all the parties should maintain status quo and there should be a minimum of uh, how to say this. Um, there shouldn't be no militarization of the Taiwan Strait. So this is something we are kind of also voicing and giving signals to China that don't poke us in the borders, resolve it, or else we can play Taiwan card anytime we want to. Or we can, we didn't mention Taiwan, but we just said militarization across the straits. So that's one thing I, I, how I would like to see. Yeah, 